whenever we feel like our focus is becoming the earth, and we feel like we're being turned to the earth, I say to you, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. Now let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians 7. If you did not hear the message Thursday night, I encourage you to go listen to that message so you can have the context uh, for this message. But uh, I'll give you some context here. Paul is talking to erring Corinthians. And the more I look at this, the more I'm convinced that predominantly he's dealing with preachers. That's who he was talking to. You know, at Corinth or these churches, when it talks about multiple elders, it's, it doesn't mean they had multiple elders in one assembly. Corinth was a huge place. It was like New York City. You don't have one church in New York City. And uh, they were spread out. They were the, you know, and there was multiple, there were pastors in each one. And, but these pastors, these preachers, and, and these brethren that were erring, they were being influenced by unbelievers. And so Paul told them that, you know, our heart's open to you. He said, if, if there's anybody that's straightened and has become narrow, it's your heart. It's in your heart because you won't receive us. So he, he rebuked them. He told them to come out, be, don't be yoked with unbelievers. And then he says this, this will be our text today. Verse 2, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 2. He says, receive us, we have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you. For I've said before that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. Christ sends His preacher to be received by His people. He says there, receive us. When Paul exhorted the Corinthians to receive us, he's speaking to everyone who heard this. You know, he wrote this letter. He sent it to the church. This was the Word of God. It was being compiled. It was being put together. So God would have him write his word and he would write to these churches and they would send this letter and then the preacher would read this to the people. This was God's word. Just like everybody here today is hearing this being read. This is God's word. And he's saying to everybody that heard it, receive us. Receive us. The, 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 he's talking to the, those that were erring that were er they believers that were erring by the influence of unbelievers. He was talking to believers who had already received them. He was talking to ministers who had received them and to ministers who were erring and had, were not receiving them. He's saying, receive us. Everybody, receive us. And the us he's talking about here are himself and all Christ's true preachers. All those in his day, all those today. Receive us. He's saying receive our gospel. Receive our, our gospel. Receive our Redeemer that we preach. Receive our exhortation and our rebuke and our instruction because it's, it's to turn you to Christ. It's to point you to Christ. Receive us. Why does He say receive Christ's messenger? Well, think about this. God the Father sent Christ. And Christ sends His preacher. And so, when you're hearing Christ's preacher, you're not only hearing the earthen vessel. You're hearing from God and His Christ. Look back at 2 Corinthians 5.20. And uh, I, as we saw Thursday, this right here, He's not speaking here to unbelievers. No, sir. He's talking to He's calling on those who have professed faith in Christ and were erring. He's calling on them 
together with the faithful brethren, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. This is God beseeching you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. When men are in error, when men are looking to, to their own way and they've turned from the, the true doctrine of God, from the doctrine of Christ, they have need of being reconciled again. They have need of being reconciled to God, of turning to God, turning to Christ, being at peace with God, being at peace with their brethren, because they've turned away. Jesus cried and He said this. So you see, brethren, when He says receive this, because we're not just here speaking on our own. It's God speaking, it's Christ speaking. And remember these words of our Lord Jesus. He said, He that believeth on Me, Believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Now if Christ could say that, I certainly can say that. He that believeth what I'm preaching, he that receives what I'm preaching, he's not believing me, he's believing Christ who sent me. Believing Christ who sent me. That's what he means by receive us, receive our gospel by believing on Christ. That's who we preach. Receive our gospel, repenting from error to Christ. Christ said this, listen, verily, verily. Now what does that mean? That means this is of utmost importance. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. So not only this, but once we believe. So this is receiving what it is to receive Christ's messenger. Receive, you're receiving Christ who sent Him and you're receiving God who sent Christ by believing on His gospel. Now not only this, once we believe, we're to receive Christ's preacher by sending them forth to preach the gospel. Go to 3 John, John 3, or third, the third letter of John. And look, at uh, verse 5. Beloved, speaking to believers, thou dost faith, doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. He's saying not only to brethren in their midst and not only preachers in their midst, but to strangers, preachers who are passing through with the gospel. And he says, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. They've gone before the church and spoken of the charity of these, of these folks that John pastored. And he said, Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. Those who preach the gospel aren't in it for money. Now, they're not taking profit from unbelievers in this world. And so he says there, they, they, uh, verse 8, Where We therefore ought to receive such... See there, we ought to receive such, receive their gospel into our hearts and also send them forward on their journey. That we might be fellow helpers to the truth. See, that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. We're here, we're here to be called out by the gospel, believe on Christ ourselves, rest in Christ ourselves, and then once He's called us out, He uses us then to be fellow helpers to promote the gospel, to send forth we not only receive the preacher in that we receive the gospel he's preached, now we give of ourselves to send them forward to preach the gospel in other places. That's the whole purpose. So that's what it is to receive Christ's preacher, and they're to be received. But now let me ask you this question. How do we determine the preacher we are to receive? How do we determine the preacher we are to receive? My subject is Christ's gospel and love. Christ's gospel and love. And I've titled it that because we know the preacher that we're to receive by the gospel they preach and by their love for the brethren. Because it will be Christ's gospel and Christ's love. Now that's just so. First of all, Christ's preacher does not wrong or corrupt, 
or defraud men with lies. They preach Christ and Him crucified. They don't corrupt or defraud or men. They preach Christ and Him crucified. The servant that sin of God, that servant that sin of God preaches the message of Him who sent Him. A faithful servant preaches the message of Him who sent Him. Go with me to John 7. When Christ took the form of a servant, when He came in the form of a servant, what did He say? Look here, John 7, 16. They were complaining that He'd not been to their seminaries and He didn't have degrees behind His name. He didn't have letters behind His name. He's never learned. Listen to what Christ said. John 7, 16. He said, he answered and he said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, of course, he believed the doctrine. Of course, it was his doctrine. But he said, as a servant of God, I'm preaching what I've been sent to preach. And look at this. If any man would do his will, if any man would do God's will, that is, believe on Christ, that's God's will. If any man would do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or of whether I speak of myself, whether it's really I'm really sin of God or I'm just an imposter pretending to be the Christ. That's what he's saying. You believe on God and you're going to know the doctrine. You can't know this doctrine without believing God. It comes through faith. He has to give the faith and a life and the faith and the repentance. But you can't know this doctrine until you believe God. When you believe God, faith is the evidence. Faith is the substance. You quit saying, I got to have more evidence and I got to... You quit doing that. You believe God. Now watch this. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Now Christ just told us how we determine who true preachers are and who false preachers are. Christ is true. There's no unrighteousness in him. And we know that because Christ came preaching the gospel of God who sent him. Go to Luke 4. What did Christ preach? Luke 4. Now he's the only, he's the only, the only messenger of God who could preach what he preached. He, he's the only one who can, well, let me explain that. I'll explain that as a, I can't, I can't preach myself. But he was sent to preach himself because he is the gospel. Look here, Luke 4, 16. Luke 4, 16. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up for to read. And there was delivered to, unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. They brought him the, the book of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. This was Isaiah 61. and he, What we could know is Isaiah 61. And he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Christ is the prophet of God. He's the prophet sent of God. He's that prophet Moses spoke about. He's the preacher. The messenger of God. That's what shepherd means. He's the pastor, sin of God. And he's the gospel that God the Father sent him to preach. He said he's, he anointed me to preach. And he anointed me to preach the gospel. He is the prophet and he's the message God sent him to preach. And he sent to the poor. He sent to the contrite, the brokenhearted, those that God's opened their heart to receive it. Look here. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The message Christ preached is Christ is the great physician. He's the only one that can heal those whose hearts He's broken. And He heals us by giving us a new heart. That's who He is. He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. Christ is the captain of our warfare. And we were taken bondage by our enemy, enemy and Christ came and He delivers His people out of bondage. Out of the bondage of Satan, sin, death, and hell. He does it by his own righteousness. That's what he came to preach. Deliverance to the captives. In recovering of sight to the blind. Christ is the light. Didn't he preach that? He said, I'm the light. And he's the only one that can give the light to his people that have been blinded in sin. That's the message he came preaching. He sent me to set at liberty them that are bruised. Here he is preaching. 
He's in the synagogue preaching this. And he says, I'm the one. I'm sent to set at liberty. I'm sent to set free them that have been bruised by sin. And he said, and if the Son of God has set you free, you'll be free indeed. He said, I've come now to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You know what he's saying there? The acceptable year of the Lord was the year of Jubilee. That's when the kinsman redeemer bought everything, all, paid all our debts and, and bought the people out from under debt and more was restored to them than what they lost. And Christ comes and He is he's the one that justified His people in the time accepted and God heard Him in the time accepted and God raised Him saving all His people. And so... He comes now and as he's preaching this gospel through his messenger, he blows that ju jubilee trumpet. The scripture says in that acceptable year, in that year of jubilee, there would be a trumpet blown. And you know it was never done. It never happened. God gave it in the Old Testament, but they never had a year of jubilee. They never observed God's law. Man never did it, so they never had a year of jubilee. But Christ comes, and he did it. He fulfilled it. Everything that was written. So this gospel is the trumpet. And he blows the trumpet in the hearts of his people and when he does, it's the acceptable year of the Lord. It's the year of Jubilee. It's when all that we lost in Adam plus more is restored to us in Christ, by Christ. And so he said this, verse 20, he closed the book and everybody's eyes was fastened on him. And look at verse 21. And he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He said, I'm the one that I'm preaching. I'm the one I've been sent to preach. I'm the one, the only one, that can do everything that I've just preached to you. That's what he's saying. He's the only one. He's Christ who alone is God's prophet, priest, and king. As the prophet, He's the one that makes the word effectual in the heart. As the priest, He's the message. It shows us He's the one that came and made reconciliation. He's the one that presented the Lamb, and He is the Lamb. He presented His blood in the holy place, and He made, he made atonement. He made propitiation with God. And now He's entered into that holy place. He's broken the middle wall of partition and the veil that separated us from God, and He's entered in, and we enter in through faith in Him. He's the high priest. He's the high priest that comes to you in mercy then and, and, and pronounces you clean, not just for a year, forever. And He's the King who has all power in heaven and earth to make certain He can get that gospel to you and get that message in your heart and make you believe it. He's the prophet, priest, and king of His people. Remember when, uh, I can show you that's what He meant. Look at Luke 7, Luke 7 and verse 20. Verse 20, whenever uh, it says here, when the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And look at verse 22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things you've seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. That shows you he's the one who fulfilled everything he just preached to us in Luke 4. And that's what he told John. So Christ is God the Father's messenger. He's the messenger of God. He's God's salvation. He's God's gospel. And Christ preached the message the Father sent him to preach. That's what he preached. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That was his gospel. That's what God the Father sent him to preach. He preached in John 6, 28. They said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? He said, this is the work of God. This is the message God sent me to preach. This is the work of God, that you believe on Him whom He hath sent. That's Christ the Lord. He said, I'm the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. 
He said, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again in the last day. See, we know Christ is the true Christ. We know He is. There's no unrighteousness in what He taught. Why? Listen carefully now. Listen. He only preached Christ and Him crucified. That's how we know. <laughs> That's how we know. So how am I going to know if the preacher I'm hearing is the preacher that Christ has sent? He's only going to preach Christ and Him crucified. He's not going to get off on something else. He's going to preach Christ and Him crucified. Just as Christ preached the message of God the Father who sent Him, Christ preacher preached Christ and Him crucified, which is the message of Christ who sends them. Matthew 28, 18. Go there with me. Matthew 28, 18. This is where Christ sent forth His preachers and He gave the charge right here. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's where we get our message right there. Whatever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all way, even to the end of the world. Amen. We'll go to Ephesians 4. Christ, there it says Christ gives His preachers, His pastors, His teachers. Look at Ephesians 4 now. Listen to this. What are we sent to preach? Ephesians 4.13 We're sent till we all come in the unity of faith, and here's, what, here's the knowledge we're trying to preach. The knowledge of the Son of God. See that? The Son of God. Look down at verse 15. Speaking the truth in love that we may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So you know what Peter did on the day of Pentecost? He didn't stand up. There, there you have needy sinners. A host of needy sinners. A host of sinners that if they died that day they would have met God in judgment without Christ and been cast into hell. And Peter knew the urgency of preaching to sinners on the mad dash to hell. And he didn't come there and talk to them about some vain doctrine. He came and he preached Christ and Him crucified to them. He preached Christ who accomplished the redemption of His people, who's raised to the right hand of the Father, and who He said is working this right now, which you now see and hear. That's what he preached. And Christ blessed it. Christ pricked those, some of those in the heart and they fell down and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They received Christ's messenger when they received Christ. He, they said to him, Be ye baptized because your sins have been remitted, declaring that it's so publicly. And they did. They did. And you know what they did? They continued in the apostles' doctrine. What they heard that day, they continued in it and they didn't turn from it. That's what they continued in. Christ's preachers went forth, the Scripture says after that, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't preach faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ if you don't preach who He is, what He did, why He did it, where He is now, what He's doing now, and what He's going to do. You can't, you can't preach and urge men to turn to Christ if you don't preach Christ. That's why in our letter back in 2 Corinthians, Paul said this. Go back there with me. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Look here. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. We preach not ourselves. Remember what Christ said? The man that preaches himself is seeking his own glory. Paul said we preach not ourselves but Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ the Lord. That's who we preach. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.18. Here's our message right here. 2 Corinthians 5.18. All things are of God, 
who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given to us this ministry of reconciliation. So that's our message, brethren, the ministry of reconciliation. What is it? Verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us this word of reconciliation. That is our gospel. Just as Christ preached the message God the Father sent him, Christ and him crucified, Christ preachers go forth and they preach the message Christ sent us to preach, Christ and him crucified. We preach Christ as our wisdom. He's the one in whom God can be just and justify His people and that would have never been come up with in our mind. We wouldn't have the wisdom to come up with. He's our wisdom. He's the wisdom who can approach God for us. He's the wisdom who can come and give you wisdom in your heart. We preach Christ as our righteousness, our only righteousness, the righteousness God's provided and the righteousness of God. And that righteousness is what we've been made in Christ. So that when God imputes His righteousness to us, it's because that's what Christ has made us. And we preach Christ our sanctification. He is our sanctifier who was made one with us. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. He made Himself one with us that He might make us one with Him. He came, we were separated from God. We were out here in darkness. And that's the opposite of being sanctified. That's not being separated out of this world and consecrated unto God. So Christ came to where we are and He made Himself one with us. Not, in, not, not sinful flesh, but He made Himself one in perfect flesh so that He could go to the cross and bear our sin in His body and bear justice for us so that righteousness was settled so that now then He can come to us in this gospel and, and enter into our heart and give us a new man that's created in holiness. His holiness and His righteousness so that now He can bring us out of the darkness into His light. He can bring us out, separate us out from unbelievers and bring us into communion and fellowship with Him. And that's what it is to be made holy. It's to be brought out by Christ and to be brought into Christ where we'll never be separated again. And we preach this, we preach Christ our redemption. He's the one who is the redemption price He's the one whose blood is that precious blood that paid the redemption and He's the Redeemer and He's the one that redeemed us out. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. And one day, brethren, He's coming again and Romans 8 says He's going to redeem us out of this world. He's going to take that which is His purchased possession and take us to glory. This is what we preach. Beware though brethren because the scripture says we're not to receive every preacher not every preacher the way we determine a preacher is sin of Christ is only if he preaches Christ crucified according to this word that's how we know go to 2 John 1 when men when men take up foolish foolish doctrines strange doctrines and you know it's strange if you hear it and you think, well, I've never heard anybody that I know preach that. And they take up some strange doctrine and they just focus all their energy and all their attention on this doctrine. They try their best to get you to believe this doctrine. If, and they act like if you don't believe this doctrine, you're going to hell. That's Gnosticism. If, if a man tells you because you don't believe a certain doctrine, you're going to hell, we're not saved by our knowledge. We're saved by Christ. We're pointing you to Christ is who we're pointing to. You got, it's not what I know that saved me. It's who I know that saved me. And it's not my knowledge that saved me. It's Him that saved me. It's coming and believing on Him and trusting Him. And any man that tells you that if you don't believe this certain doctrine, you're going to hell, or believe it as fully as they believe it, or whatever, that's just plain out Gnosticism. That's putting confidence in knowledge. And that's not our confidence. Our confidence is Christ. Now watch this. 2 John, look at verse 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. What have I preached to you this morning? 
what I've been preaching is the doctrine of Christ. If a man doesn't abide in the doctrine of Christ, he hath not God. You see that? He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. It's not because he abideth in the doctrine in the sense that he knows so much of the doctrine and all this. What he's talking about is the man who is a true disciple of Christ will hear Christ and follow Christ and look to Christ and not look to anybody else. Not depend on anything else or anyone else for his salvation. In all aspects of it, he'll look only to Christ. That's what he's talking about. And a man that doesn't abide in that doctrine but turns from it and starts preaching a necessity, a doctrine that's ne necessary for you to believe or you can't be saved. That man's trying to exalt himself. And, and God says, look out. Look out. Watch this. Verse 10, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. You don't receive him into your head and you don't send him forward on his way preaching the gospel either. Because he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil, evil deeds. Preachers who count the ministry of reconciliation a vain thing. You know what they'll do? Eventually they'll prove it. They count the ministry of reconciliation vain. They eventually will prove it by turning to something else. Oh, they'll say they're doing this for the glory of God and they're doing this for the furtherance of Christ. Believers know. Believers know. They're not going to fool believers. Christ said if it was possible, they would deceive the very elect. They won't do it though because it's not possible. God's people, God's going to make sure, the Spirit of God in you is going to make sure you hear it and you know that string's out of tune. That's not, that's not my Lord talking. A man may claim to be preaching Christ, but if his objective is to merely support some strange doctrine to prove his point, rather than giving God all the glory and salvation, rather than preaching Christ and Him crucified, that's not of God. It's not of God. It's not of God. What, just what Brother Art read. This is what Christ's preacher is sent to preach. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, cry unto her, and here's our message, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. God's not treating you as if it's pardoned. He pardoned it, brethren. Preached to her that she's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sin. He restored you more than what you lost. The voice said, cry. He said, what shall I cry? What's my doctrine to preach? Here it is. It's so simple. Here it is. It's, it's two parts. Number one, all flesh is grass. Preach man down. Preach man down. Preach the sinner down. You can't preach the sinner down low enough. Preach him down to he's nothing but a maggot and include yourself in it. And here's the second aspect of the doctrine. In Isaiah 49, he said, Behold your God. Behold your God. He'll lead his sheep like a shepherd. He'll carry the lambs in his bosom. Preach Christ and him crucified. Behold your God. John said, pointed to Christ and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. That was his message. That was his message. That was the very first message I ever preached. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him in eternity, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Behold him in all the Old Testament uh, ceremonies and types. Behold Him as He walked this earth, nailed to a cursed tree, redeeming His people. Behold Him now ruling and reigning on the cross. That was my points. Behold the Lamb of God. And God help me. God keep me. And if He don't keep me, I won't do it. But if God keeps me, that's going to be my message to the last breath I take. If any man teach otherwise, Paul said, and consent not to wholesome words, the words of the Lord Jesus, he's proud. He doesn't know anything. He's going about from envy and strife. and That's all it is. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. But look here, 2 Corinthians 6. Look what he tells us. And this is the heart of every one of Christ's true preachers right here. 2 Corinthians 6, 3. Give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. 
but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Whenever Brother Cody Groover died, Winna, I was talking to Winna, and she said, we always pray that above everything else, we pray God would not allow us to do anything that would reproach, bring reproach on the gospel. And she said, by God's grace, I can say that Cody never did anything to bring reproach on the gospel of Christ. Secondly, we know Christ's preacher by his love for the brethren. Go back now to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 2. The ministers of Christ wrong no man, they corrupt no man, and they defraud no man. Now our Lord said clearly, you'll know them by their fruit. Titus talked about men who in, in word they claim to preach Christ, but in deed, in the works, they deny Him. Now brethren, listen to me carefully. You can know a man's message by hearing him on the internet. But you can't know this about him by listening to him on the internet. You can't know the man. And this is just as important. This is just as important. Well, how so? Well, if he's fleecing everybody, don't you think that's important? <laughs> well, sure it is. Christ defrauded no man. He didn't corrupt anybody, and neither do his ministers. Because they're led of God. His preachers don't seek to have preeminence. They don't seek to have vainglory. And, and, and they don't seek filthy lucre. They don't seek to fleece the brethren. Christ won't allow that. Christ came to save. He came to enrich. He didn't come to fleece and He won't let His preachers do it. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, Paul said, Our exhortation was not of deceit. What we preach to you wasn't of deceit. He said, Nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. And not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak, a disguise of covetousness. God is witness. We never did. He said in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, I seek not yours. I don't seek your silver, your gold, your apparel. I'm not seeking yours. I seek you. I seek the salvation of your soul is what I'm looking for. He said, did I make a gain of you by any of them who I sent to you? Christ's preacher doesn't leave one church. Go to another church. And then another church. And then another church. And then another church. And every step of the way, get himself more money and more glory. Christ preacher don't do that. Now God might move him from one church to another, but he, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't move him from one to the other, to the other, to the other. And every single time, just so happens, he got a raise and his life was better and he got more glory and applause. Be careful. That's not of God. You can't know that about a man listening to him on the internet. 3 John 1, 9. And I'm telling you this, brethren, because this, this is... This is uh, Christ said if it was possible, they'd deceive the very elect. Look, second, uh, 3 John, and uh, look at verse 9. This is the loving apostle. I wrote unto the church, he said, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I'll remember his deeds which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words. 
not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren. He forbids them that would. He casts them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. You see that? God's preachers aren't going to fleece His people. They just not do it. They, they love His people. Christ didn't condemn men, neither do His ministers. Look at our text. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 3, I speak not this to condemn you. I speak not this to condemn you. You know, whenever, if you go through, go, go home and read 2 Corinthians. And see, read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and see how often when Paul would say something that was a sharp rebuke, he always made certain they understood that he wasn't trying to shame them. He wasn't trying to condemn them. He wasn't saying they were lost. He wasn't standing in doubt of them. He, did, he was saying, I'm, I'm, I love you. I'm trying to teach you something here. And that's they, it, God's preachers. Christ dwelt in Paul. And, and so the Spirit of Christ was in Paul. And he didn't condemn men when he preached. Why? Christ said, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God sent Christ to a people He chose to save them. He didn't send Christ to condemn them. Why? Because we're already condemned, brethren. We're already condemned in our father Adam. We're already fallen and condemned and sinners. We don't need for somebody to come and, and, and condemn us. We need somebody to come preach Christ to us by which Christ saves us. That's what we need. You know, it's a sad thing that you, you, I fell into this early on in the ministry. You know, you prepare, you work, you want to labor, and you have somebody on your heart, and you come to preach the gospel thinking this is be great for them to hear, and they're not there. And it hurts you really bad. And then when they do show up, you find yourself wanting to rebuke them for not being there. Well, that ain't the time to do that. <laughs> They're there now. Preach what you want to preach to them. Preach the gospel to them. Don't whip them. That's just immaturity. Christ preachers aren't trying to condemn His people. I speak not this to condemn you. Our, our goal as ministers is not to try to draw a line in the sand. We're not trying to build up a wall and say, unless you're on this side with me, now you're not saved. We're not doing that, brethren. We, we, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.14, here was his heart, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. I tell you what you're not going to hear God's preacher do. Now, if he's immature, young, you might hear him do this, or if he just, you know, occasionally you might hear him, you know, use the wrong pronoun. But God's preacher... The tenor of his message is not going to be to stand up and say, shame on you. No. If, he, if there's shame on somebody for something, you know what he's going to say? Shame on us. Shame on us. He's going to put himself in the number with you. He's not going to say, you're a worm, you're a worm, you're a worm. He's going to say, we're the worms. You get what I'm saying? He's not going to exalt himself over you and preach down to you, condemning you, He's going to preach and say, I'm just right there with you. I'm the chief of sinners. I'm telling you this because I know it's fact. I'm telling you what we are because I'm there with you. I know what we are. And he's, he's wanting you all, if he could sit there in the pew with you and everybody be looked up at Christ, he'd do that. That's how he'd preach to you. But he has to stand and preach and declare the gospel to you. But he's wanting us all to be looking at Christ, not at any one of us. <coughs> Certainly not at himself. Go to 1 Peter 5. I got to close this up. 1 Peter 5. Look here. Because this is this is the this is what we got from the Lord. This is this is the Spirit of the Lord. 1 Peter 5 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, not for your own profit, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Look at verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, and I'll tell you who that includes, the younger preachers as well as the younger brethren. Submit yourselves unto the elder. 
Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. If I'm not humbled under God, if I'm proud, you know what I'm doing? I'm trying to exalt myself in my time. He says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand that He might exalt you in His due time. Cast all your care on Christ. But false preachers are arrogant and exalting themselves and rebuking elders that got so much more experience than they have. But you know what God's people and, and preachers do when that happens? We sit there thinking, this is so very sad. These folks are glorying in their shame. Making fools of themselves. Glorying in their shame. And yet we know that's exactly what I'll do. That's exactly what I will do if God don't keep me. And you pray. You pray for, Lord, keep them. Lord, break them. Lord, humble them. Lord, bring us all down to God's feet to see Him. And don't let any one of us exalt ourselves over another. Ever, ever, ever. Now look at this last thing in our text, and I'll, I'll quit. I love this. Verse 3, he said, Because I've said before, that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. Doesn't, it, doesn't you think that ought to say you're in our hearts to live and die with you? He said you're in our hearts to die and to live with you. God's pre preacher and God's people are filled with the love of God so that our desire is to serve God together in the unity of the Holy Spirit till we die and then to live together forever. <laughs> Can you imagine leaving somebody in your family and just walking away from them? I can more so imagine doing that to an earthly family member that didn't know God, but I can't dare imagine doing that to one of my brethren in Christ. Our desire is to live in unity together all our lives to the day we die and then live forever and eternity together. I want to end by reading 1 Corinthians 13. Go there with me. The Lord said, Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. You, you see a man that's lifted up in pride, he's whipping folks and calling you a fool and shaming you because you don't believe what he, this, this obscure doctrine that he's supposedly found now. That's, that's knowledge without love. Knowledge is puffing him up, brethren. But look at this. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffereth long. This, this is Christ right here. This is Christ. And because this is Christ, this is his part of his child. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Doth, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil of brethren. It doth think evil of brethren. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Preaching, that's going to fail. Tongues, they're going to cease. Knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Verse 9, we know in part, we prophesy in part. We don't have any business calling somebody an unbeliever simply because they, they believe uh, or don't believe the, exactly how we believe particular redemption or unlimited atonement. Now, now, I'm not talking about somebody that believes we're saved by free will works and that we believe Christ died for everybody and He's a failure. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody that believes the gospel, but they don't, you know, that you have certain thing you believe and they believe you don't quite agree together. We know in part, brethren, we have no business judging our brethren and condemning our brethren. Especially using the gospel to do it. Using Christ to do that. Look at this. But when that is perfect is come, then that which is in part should be done away. And when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. What's he talking about? Right now, we're all just children. When Christ comes and we're perfect, that's when we're going to put away these childish things. 
Look, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now about a faith, hope, charity. All three. But the greatest, this is the one that won't ever end, charity. When I see Christ, I won't need faith. And I won't, when I'm in glory with Him, I won't need hope. But I'm going to still love. I'm going to love Him. I'm going to love my brethren. You're in our hearts to be in union together till the day we die and then live forever. That's the heart of God's preacher. That's the heart of God's preacher. All right, brethren, let's be dismissed.